All right, good morning. Welcome to our continuing classes in the book of Acts. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 3 this morning. Glad for everyone's attendance. Acts chapter 3. This is our fifth class. And we'll be covering the third chapter into the first four verses of chapter 4. Let's begin with our Acts facts. These are our um, alliterations, which are our uh, memory summary statements, where we try to memorize the basic content of each chapter. Helps with uh, recall what the text talks about. And we do want to emphasize these, uh, especially the teachers who will be teaching the children's classes next quarter. Use this as a as a memory drill. Uh, I guess if the elders have. Uh, has there been a list put out for memory work or memory verses? I don't know if there has been or not. I've not seen it. I don't think so. Okay. So these would, these would work in the place of that, and it helps everyone realize, or well, not realize, but remember what each chapter does discuss. So what was the Acts fact for chapter 1? And we'll do this every class, kind of build our list as we go through the class together. Ascension and appointment. Jesus ascended. And then uh, Matthias was the, was the appointed replacement for Judas Iscariot. All right. Chapter 2. Pentecost, which is when the church began, and Peter's preaching, the first gospel sermon. Today, chapter 3, the memory statement or the memory uh, recall statement is lame man and lesson. We're talking about the lame man who was healed in chapter 3. And then the lesson is Peter's second sermon. And I will, I will give you a printed copy of the entire list, um, either at the end of this quarter when it's half full, <laughs> or those who want to be in the class next quarter, all 28 um, Acts facts. All right. So lame man in lesson this morning. Okay, let's look at the first 11 verses of chapter 3. This is the healing of the anonymous um, lame man. Now, the chapter uh, opens or begins with Peter and John. Um, Continuing the initial behavior of the first Christians. Go back to chapter 2, look at verses 42 and 46, just to sort of get our context here. When the gospel was first preached, uh, Luke writes that those uh, who had uh, obeyed the gospel in verse 41, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. That is their their spiritual activity, their, their congregational activity. But coupled with that, look at verse 46. Where did they spend their congregational time? Where, where did they worship? In the temple. So continuing daily in the temple, and then also from house to house, they spent social time together. But I'm, I'm emphasizing the time they spent together in the temple. So when chapter 3 begins, that we're studying uh, this morning, where are Peter and John going? Naturally, they're going to the temple. What time of day was it, as Luke writes? It was the, it was the hour of prayer, so that they, they, they were going for, for prayer. Ninth hour, which uh, would be, I think, about uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, our, our time. So they're, they're going to the temple, and I don't know that they expected to see this lame man. I don't think he expected what was going to happen. That, that wasn't on anybody's mind. So they encounter this man, this, this uh, uh, anonymous, this known lame man. Now I have on the chart some verses from this chapter, chapter 3, as well as ones we'll see in the next chapter, chapter 4. We won't really get to those today, but just sort of giving you a, a heads up to those are the verses that are coming. Luke does write in verse 2, uh, when did his lameness begin? From his mother's womb. So th this man had never walked. He was, he was born lame. And we also learn from chapter 4, those verses that I'm going to get to next, next class, he's over 40 years old. So he's not a young man in the sense that this is a new illness. I mean, he's, I think he's pretty young myself, <laughs> given I'm on the side of 55, but it, th he's not an elderly man is what I'm saying, but he has had this ailment, this illness for all his life. 
This isn't anything recent. And I'm saying that because he was brought to the temple uh, daily. How did he make his living? He was a beggar. I don't know about you, but I've never, I don't think I've had to really beg for anything in my life. I've asked for lots of things. But to be a legitimate beggar where you're relying solely, and I mean entirely on the goodwill of other people, I don't have a lot of experience in that. So in, in my mind, I, I picture this, this pitiful man. He can't even walk. It says in verse 2, he was being carried along whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple called Beautiful in order to beg alms of those who are entering the temple. So he's going to beg of those who were the, probably the more generous character people who would give him something. People who had a, a mind about serving God. People who had a mind about, you know, doing the right thing. And so he just, that he depended on someone carrying him there. And then he just spent his entire day asking for what little anybody would give him. It's, it's, it's a sad situation. I, want, I just want you to think about that. And, and don't get too flowery with this, but, you know, build this in the mind of your students. Kind of, kind of talk this through so that they can see that's what, this, that's what was going on. And so along comes Peter and John. They're going in there to pray. What does this man do? He asked them for alms. I don't think he knew they were apostles. I don't know that the text doesn't suggest that. Maybe he knew who they were. We don't know. But he treats Peter and John like he treats everyone else. So he asked them for alms. You'll see there in verse 3. Now, Peter and John are going to reply. What's the first thing Peter says in verse 4? This is to me is interesting. Look at me. <laughs> he doesn't say, uh, I don't have anything. Or he doesn't dig into his cloak and, and into a pocket and, and give him uh, this or that. He says initially, look at me. Or look at us. And the lame man does what in verse 5? Well, he, he does that. Why? Because Peter said so. But really, what's, what's in his mind? I'm going to get something. He says he expected to receive something from them. Now, here's the classic line that I think there's even a song little children sing uh, about this episode. Peter says, silver and gold have I none. I don't have anything monetarily. But, what's he say next? What I do have, I give to you. Now, think about this. What does Peter have that he's fixing to do? I'm going to heal you. I've got power. That's a whole lot. It's worth a whole lot more than this money you're begging me for. What I do have, I give to you. And then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, when you see this phrase in the New Testament, whether it's written by an apostle's hand, which we'll see like in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul uses that phrase in dealing with that uh, incestuous situation in Corinth. Or is it spoken here by Peter? When an apostle either says or writes, by the name of or in the name of Jesus Christ, what is that apostle doing? He's invoking the authority of the king. I'm calling upon the authority by the power of Jesus Christ. He says, walk. He doesn't say, let me help you walk. He says, you get up and walk. Now, what was this man's condition again? Lame from... Uh, Cheryl's our resident expert in medical issues in the room. What about this man's ankles? He, nothing. He would have nothing. It wasn't like this, again, it was a recent injury where he had walked for so many years prior and then he got hurt. And that happens to people. We, we don't dismiss that at all. But this man had no muscles, no, no, he, he had nothing in his legs. And to tell a man that's crippled from birth, get up and walk. Well, either Peter's a nut, he's crazy, which that's not the case, or he knows that it's going to happen right now. And so you look at verse 7. Seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. Do you do that to a, to a crippled man from birth? No, because again, he's got no strength in his legs or his ankles to support himself. He's got nothing. 
Peter stands him up. And then there's that very important word in verse 7. Immediately. Immediately. His ankles and feet were strengthened. Now, let me pause right here. Um, I think it's important to emphasize when you're teaching this story about the Bible word miracle. Let's, let's be sure that we have the children understand what a biblical, what the nature of a miracle is. Okay? If you had to define a miracle, what words would you use? How would you describe a miracle? It defies the laws of nature. Jesus walking on the water. You don't walk on water. That's not solid. Uh, healing people just like that. Raising the dead. We just recently had our second grandchild born. He's two weeks old. Man, he's awesome, by the way. But then I hear talk about Luca. I'm, I'm just saying. But my mother, we, we FaceTime her. Oh, he's just a little miracle. Well, I know what people mean when they say that, but there's nothing miraculous about the birth process. That's entirely natural. He's special. All babies are special. But if we're going to call something a miracle, let's make sure we talk about it the way the Bible talks about it. Here's a lame man who had never walked in his life. And Peter says, get up and walk. And he seizes him by the right hand and stands him up. And it, it, it didn't say a few hours later. It didn't say a week. It said immediately his feet and ankles received strength. That's a miracle. That's what we're talking about. And I think children can understand that if we describe it in you know, the, the proper way. So this idea of a Bible miracle, let's, let's make sure they get that idea firm in their, in their minds. So after he is now standing, and when he stands up, what does he begin to do? Something he's never done before. He's walking and he's leaping. I mean, I can imagine this, this man in his, in his thinking, uh, well, this is what running feels like. This is what jumping and leaping th uh, feels like. This is just absolutely tremendous. So he, uh, verse 8, with, and with a leap, my version says, he stood upright, began to walk. So he goes in the temple with Peter and John, and as he's going in, what is he doing? He's praising God. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's an understatement, I would think. That's exactly what he felt like. So rightly so, walking and leaping and praising God. So the crowd now sees this. Did the crowd know who this beggar was? Oh, they saw him every day. He was the known beggar. And so can you imagine, as they see this man, if he's running in the temple or he's walking and leaping around, I'd be tempted to say, let's, for sake of argument, let's, let's call him Joe, just because we're going to give him a name. Isn't that Joe? <laughs> right, leaping into the temple? I don't, what in the world has happened? That's the guy who's always here sitting at the, the guy they have to carry in every day who cannot walk. And there he is walking and leaping in the temple with those two guys. Something's going on. Something has happened here. Now, what is the purpose of a miracle? Well, this is a passage that Joy Silder brought to our attention back in a couple of classes ago. In Mark 16, verse 20, when Mark closes his gospel after the Great Commission, as Mark records it, Mark wrote that they went out and they performed signs, accompanying signs that confirmed the word as it was being preached. So God would empower his servants, namely the apostles, other evangelists after uh, the apostles laid their hands on them to perform these miraculous uh, feats of power. I'm convinced based on Mark 16, so the people then would listen to what they've got to say. You saw what I just did. Now let me tell you something. Let me preach the gospel to you. Let me tell you about the power behind what I just did. And so they get, it gets everyone's attention. You'll see there in verse, um, verse 9, they saw him walking, praising God. Verse 10, they were taking note. My version says, how does the New King James begin verse 10? They knew that it was he. All right. They knew. I, yes. I mean, you, you don't... You don't go there every day and not know who Joe was. I mean, that's the lame man. And so they say they took note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. They had no answer for this. I don't think anybody would have an answer for this. It was so different than what had happened 
every day. Now, so that's the encounter that Peter and John had with the lame man. Now, again, I'm convinced, at least in my mind, I'm convinced what they just did has set the table now, set the stage for the preaching of the gospel again. And Peter's fixing to do that. So here's the second gospel sermon. We had the first one in chapter 2. Now here's the second sermon, verses 12 through 26. So Peter is going to start speaking. So the, uh, verse 11 uh, says, while he was clinging to Peter and John. So that's, that's them going into the temple. I mean, I would imagine this, this man, Joe, thinks, here's my two, my, my two new best friends right here. I mean, look what they just did for me. Uh, you, you can imagine the, the love he had for these two men. They gave him something that he was asking for money, but they gave him something a whole lot more important than, than money. So Peter questions their wonder. Look in verse 12. When Peter saw this, that is, everyone having this, uh, uh, this amazement come over them, he sees that. He responds to the people, verse 12. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Well, that seems like an, uh, kind of an odd question. I think most anybody would marvel at this, what they saw. But yet Peter says, why do you marvel at this? Or even a better question, or why do you gaze at us? Me, me and John. As if by our own power or piety, we have made this man walk. We didn't do this. Now, naturally, everyone's going to have their gaze fixed on Peter and John because they're the ones that got this man up and got him to walk. But Peter's deflecting all the attention off himself now, isn't he? He's saying, this isn't, this isn't about us. I've got the first point here on the chart. I, I, I can't prove this. But at least in my mind, I wonder, maybe was some of this crowd also present at the first sermon? And if they were, what did they witness just a little while ago that was unusual? Yes. Those languages that came, all the apostles, not just Peter and John, but all the apostles were speaking in tongues that were not their native tongue. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. So perhaps, and I'm doing some perhapsing, I don't want to get too far off into that. That's chasing a rabbit and I'm holding I can't prove. But for Peter to say, why are you all amazed about this? Maybe some of them just saw these two men with the other ten do something very amazing not long back. At any rate, <clears throat> whether that's true or not. But then Peter says, look, and I didn't do this. This has nothing to do with me. But it's, it's as if he's saying, let me tell you about the one that's behind all this. That's the one I want to talk to you about. The very first words in verse 13, he launches right into discussing who? God. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Why would those be good names for Peter to drop to this audience? Is that, is that going to mean something? Absolutely. These, remember, the, 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 these are Jews. So they would, oh yeah, Abraham, I know him, and Isaac and Jacob, the father of the patriarchs, the tribe of Israel, all those ideas. He says, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, that God names this audience would know extremely well. He says, the same God, that God who was their God, has also, he says, glorified his servant Jesus. So he connects the two. Now, let's take a step back just for a moment. We don't want to get too deep into this. But what had been the typical Jewish reaction to Jesus, especially in Jerusalem? Well, he fought with them all. I, mean, I don't know if Jesus didn't fight, but he, he, they contended with him. I mean, all through his, his ministry. And, of course, what eventually happened to him? Well, they killed him. So Peter is saying, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that you accept, that you readily say, yeah, that's our fathers. That's our ancestors. Well, that same God raised up his servant Jesus. And keep reading what he says. The one whom, and here, here it is again, what, what's he indict them of? The one whom you delivered. So just like the first sermon, Peter is, is boring in on your, you, you have the guilt, you, you have the sin, the guilt of murdering the one who God glorified. You delivered him, you disowned him. That's in verse 13. Also at the end of verse 13, what does Peter bring up? He didn't bring this up in the first sermon. 
What fact does he mention in verse 13? There, there at the end. Yeah. Had Pilate made up his mind to release Jesus? Yes. Now, Pilate was a political coward. We're, we're going to call it like it is. He, he, he could have said from his judgment seat, being the governor of Judea, listen, I'm, I'm not going further with this. This man has committed nothing worthy of death, and this, these proceedings are dismissed. So get out of here. But he didn't do that. He was a coward. So he, in his mind, he, he was going to release him. But he, he bowed to pressure to keep the Jews happy. So Peter reminds them, um, you delivered him up and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So it was bad enough. Peter says, you delivered him and you disowned or you disinherited him, some versions may say. You denied him. But if that wasn't bad enough, which it was, but they doubled down and did what on top of that? He says in verse 14. Yeah, if disowning Christ wasn't bad enough, you, you, you clamored, let Barabbas be released. Barabbas was a known murderer. He was a thug. And they'd rather have him <clears throat> than have Jesus released. And so Peter brings that up too. You asked or you uh, asked for a murderer to be granted to you. So they denied the holy and righteous one. And as Luke writes in Luke 23, they asked for Barabbas to be released as well. Now there could be, a, I don't know if there's a, a play on words here. But as, as Peter talks about this, look in verse 15. He says, you put to death. He didn't say you put Christ to death. He said you put to death who? The Prince of Life. Notice the contrast. <clears throat> Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. In speaking about him being the good shepherd in John 10, you know, the hireling flees and runs away. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So here we have, here we have these, these two maybe just as a way of, of using expressive language in his preaching. Peter says, he was the prince of life, and you killed him. Just to draw attention to how, how serious a charge this was. Well, it doesn't stop there, does it? What's Peter mention again? Verse 15, you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God, you killed him, but God raised him up. So there's our teaching point. And as I've said in prior classes, you will see a lot of the similar teaching points from lesson to lesson. Don't, <clears throat> don't view that as unimportantly redundant. Keep hammering those things home. God raised Jesus from the dead. The Acts record talks about that a lot. And so even in his second sermon, Peter mentions it again. God raised him up. And verse 15 concludes, a fact to which we, that is, we apostles, namely right here, Peter and John, we're witnesses. We, we've, we saw it. We saw him. We talked to him after the, after the resurrection. So, uh, the same God who was the God of the patriarchs, the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the tribes, your, your ancestry, is the same God who raised up this servant whom you killed. You asked for a murderer, delivered him up to death, but God raised him up and we've seen him. Now that's, that's his point in a nutshell right there. That's the, that's the context of the sermon so far. Then he says this, verse 16. Now I'm going to spend some time on this. Verse 16. On the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. On the basis of faith. Now, I don't believe this was Peter saying, this man believed. There's nothing in the text that I see that this lame man had exhibited any faith. Because when Peter said, look at us, what did he write earlier? This was in verse 5. What was his focus? Money. He, he's there to beg money. All right. That's what he did every day was beg money. So I believe when Peter says on the basis, it's on the basis of faith in his name, he's talking about him and John's faith. And I want to I want to emphasize that. Look at Matthew 17 real quick. Matthew 17 verses 14 through 21. We won't read 
all of it because I don't want to use up all my time. I want to get to the rest of the material for today. But there was an episode earlier in, in the gospel. <clears throat> and there was, a, there was a man who came to, the, to a Jesus. You see there Matthew 17, verse 15. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. So he brings him to Jesus. Well, the, the boy gets cured. But Jesus also addresses, look at verse 17. O oh, faithless, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. So he heals the one. Then drop down to verse uh, 19. What did the disciples ask Jesus privately? Yeah, why didn't, where did we go wrong? <laughs> What's Jesus say? Verse 20, the first few words. It's because of your lack of belief, your, your unbelief. So the disciples failed on this moment because their faith wasn't enough. Well, that's not their problem now. They're fully engaged in the gospel work. They're empowered by the Holy Spirit. So I believe when Peter says it's on the basis of faith in his name. We truly believed, given this ambassadorial work we're doing now as apostles, that when we told this man, get up and walk, we had no doubt it was going to happen. Faith in his name. And I want to come back to this application. That would be one of our applications at the end of our lesson that we can, that we can draw some, some strength from. This points of faith. So, through verse 16, look at the chart now. Through verse 16, Peter has discussed the power behind this name, Jesus. He hasn't done any inviting yet in the sermon. Really, he hasn't. There's been no invitation, if you will. But now... Peter will begin his exhorting in verse 17. All because of what's happened. They saw the miracle. Peter launches into the sermon. He talks about the power behind the episode, the, the miraculous episode that took place. Now it's time to talk to my audience. Now it's time to draw them in with what I've said so far. So here's his, here's his exhorting. He invites his audience to respond. Verse 17. He says, Now, brethren, I know that what you did, that is to say, in the rejecting of the Christ, in, in, in having him killed, asking for the murderer to be released in, in his place, so forth and so on, he invites them to respond. He says, what you did, you did it in ignorance. Now, someone may take what he says there in verse 17. I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. Well, if they were ignorant of some things, well, then they're not culpable. They're not accountable. I don't think that's what Peter is saying. If that were so, if they weren't accountable, then in verse 19, why the exhortation to repent? What would they have to repent of if they were guiltless in this matter? Well, that's not what Peter means when he says, you did this in ignorance. I think ignorance is, in other words, a, a lack of full understanding of what was going on. Now, what you did, it's on the record. You, you fully rejected the Christ. You fully delivered him up to be killed. And you fully asked for and clamored for the release of the murderer instead. There's no disputing that. But it was in ignorance. Um, in Ephesians 4, look in verse 18. Real, real quickly. Ephesians 4, verse 18. Paul will later write about this. When he says in verse 17 that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk the fertility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart. A person can be ignorant in that their understanding is darkened. They don't have all the facts yet. But that doesn't mean that they're not culpable or accountable. They just don't have all the facts yet. Maybe akin to our, our familiar phrase in our culture, well, ignorance is no excuse of the law. You get stopped by a policeman speeding. Well, I didn't know the limit here was only 55. Well, how's that going to work for you? Not likely. The law is still the law. You know, you don't know it. Doesn't mean you're innocent. You just you're not fully informed. And I believe that's what Peter is saying. You acted in ignorance, just like your fathers did. He says. And it's inexcusable because look at verse 18. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ should suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Again, this is a crowd. Would they have known the prophets? 
Well, let me say, should they have known the prophets? Yes. One such passage comes to mind, we read it often at the table, is Isaiah 53. A, a specific prophecy about the suffering of the Messiah. Beautiful passage. There are others besides that. Well, that's just one on the chart I put there. So he says, the prophets talked about this. There's no excuse here in what you've done. And he, he, he then challenges them. Here's what you need to do. You're ignorant of this. Well, I'm going to try to help you out of your situation. What's his first word in verse 19? Repent. Go back to chapter 2. When the apostles were asked by the crowd, what shall we do? What was Peter's first word there? Repent. See, we're talking about change. We're talking about transformational behavior this year at Eastside. Well, that's where it begins. He says, repent. Now, there's two components to this. Look at verse 19. He says, repent. Where does repentance occur? It's in your head, your heart. Not your blood pumping muscle, but your, your mind. Your, your inner self. A person will never change his or her behavior until they decide inside, I'm going to stop doing this and then go do the opposite. That's where it begins. Now, some versions say, repent, therefore, and be converted, the King James says, I believe. My version says, repent, therefore, and return. Okay, the return, the conversion, that's the outer actions. But you don't do that until you do this inside your head first. And I think this is something we can hammer home to the children. They, they can understand this. God wants us to do His will. But it starts inside our head. We, we decide. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Maybe you can say it that way to the children. And then your actions will follow those thought processes. All right? So you put these two together. The, the, the inner resolve and the, the outward actions. And I'm going to go back to these two places real quickly. Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. When John was baptizing by the wilderness, as you recall, and uh, the Pharisees come out to him and Sadducees, and he says, you brood of vipers, <laughs> you bunch of snakes, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Look at verse 8. He says, therefore, bring forth fruit that is meat for repentance. Show the fruit that proves you've changed on the inside is what he's saying. If you've truly repented, let's see some outward action here. That that's what's happening. Well, that's what repentance is. And conversion. That, that's what it means to repent and return. We'll get to Acts 26, many classes from now, but it's sort of the same thing. Where we show our, our change, we, we show our mental change by our outward actions. And so when Peter is saying that, these, these two do go together. Right? And we have, to, we have to make sure that that's solidified in the minds of our students. Change your course of action. Change. And then be fully converted to Christ. How are they going to get out of this mess where they delivered Christ to be killed? They asked for the murderer in place. He says, you need to change, repent and return. Repent, change, and be converted. And that's how you get out of this mess that you're in. Sins, he said, would be wiped away. Imagine that. We have a, a whiteboard here. We have all this marking. We just take an erasure. We just wipe that away. It's gone. When remission of when when, uh, when uh, forgiveness has been granted by God, it's wiped. It's, it's wiped clean. Matthew sixteen, John twenty. Jesus told the apostles, "You're going to be in the business of remitting or retaining sins. Whose sins ye remit, they are remitted. Whose sins are retained, they are retained. That's the business they're in, and that's what Peter is doing here on this occasion in his in his preaching." He says, if you do those things, what's going to happen to you? Verse 19. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I've always liked that phrase. You know, Jesus talked about sin in Matthew 11, his great imitation. You know, come to me, all ye that labor, and your heavy sin is such a heavy burden. It just, it just wears you. It, you can't carry it around your whole life. It, it, it'll crush you. You got to get rid of that. To have these times of refreshing. That's what Peter is saying. It's a beautiful language. Beautiful thought here. And he says, then Jesus, that he may send Jesus to Christ appointed for you. Now there's some, some, some would say that this phrase, that he may send Jesus to you. Um, is he talking about Jesus coming the second time? I don't think so. Because if we wait until Jesus comes before we repent, then what's our condition? Well, it's too late. <laughs> Can't do anything about that. 
I believe he's talking here about when Jesus says, like in Revelation 3 and verse 20, and John 14, verse 23, that if, 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 we, if Jesus will come in a, in a, not a miraculous, mystic sort of way, but a, it's a relationship. I will come to you, and I, I will come into him, and I will dine with him, and he, and he with me. Now, that's very expressive language, but I believe that's what Peter is saying. If you repent and return, God will send Jesus to you in this relationship kind of a thing. Christ will dwell in your hearts by faith, as Ephesians 3 and verse 17 teaches. You'll have this intimate relationship with Christ, and that's on a personal level. Those who repent and return, you have that. You can have that. But you have, to, you have to meet the Lord halfway, have this special relationship. And then he says, Jesus will remain in heaven, whom heaven must receive, verse 21, until the period of restoration of all things. And then at, at, the verse, uh, at the end of verse 21, he mentions these prophets again. So here's more, here's more fulfillment of prophecy. Back in Deuteronomy 18, that familiar passage, remember Moses talked about God was going to raise up another prophet from among your brethren? If all we had was that passage, who was Moses talking about? We don't know. He wasn't named. But a few classes ago I said, who's the best interpreter of an inspired man? Another inspired man. Peter tells us here, verse 22 of Acts 3. That's who Moses was discussing because Peter quotes that passage from Deuteronomy 18. This prophet, that's who Moses was talking about, that God was going to raise up. And everyone, he says, verse 23, that shall, an, it shall be that everyone who does not heed that prophet. What happens if you don't heed Christ? What's Peter say? Verse 23, you'll be destroyed. It's, it's to your own doom, your own detriment, if you don't give heed to what Christ says. So his invitation now, he's, I mean, he's, he's in full-throated now. So here's what you need to do. You need to repent. You need to return. God wants to send Jesus to you to have this relationship. And if you don't heed him, you'll, be dis you'll, you'll suffer eternally. I mean, that's just a great imitation of the gospel sermon right there. So, he invites his audience to respond. Doesn't he? Verse, 20, uh, verse 24, again, talking about these prophets. Christ and his salvation have always been promised for all of mankind. Yes, the Jews had initial privileges uh, apart from the Gentiles. To them were committed the first oracles, the principles of God. That's in Romans chapter 3 and verse 2. They had the word of God the Gentiles didn't have. We understand that. But salvation has always been not just for Jews, but for Gentiles as well. And Christ was raised up for them, he says, so that you could turn from your wicked ways. That's how the sermon concludes in verse 26. Now, the curriculum has us stopping at the end of chapter 3, but I want to look at the few verses of chapter 4, I think it goes with us. We will see how this turned out. So look at verse 1. As they were speaking, what happened to Peter and John on the negative side? Bad. They were arrested. They were nabbed. <laughs> Put in jail. Bullying tactics meant to, I think, intimidate them, silence them. And recall their point of contention as Luke writes there in verse 2. They were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That got them in trouble. Sadducees are mentioned particularly in that passage. Now from a positive side, so that's how the leaders took it. What about the people? Verse 4. But many of those who heard the message believed. And what does Luke write? The results are up to date now. There was 3,000 obeyed the gospel in chapter 2. What about now? 5,000 men. I'm convinced it may be even double when you add in women and any children who may have obeyed the gospel, who were old enough to understand what the preaching was said. I'm going to skip this part for sake of time right here. So that's where the, 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 the gospel is, is growing, up to 5,000 men. Now, our teaching points, real quickly. Christ has been raised from the dead. That was mentioned again in the sermon. This is a previous point. Again, reemphasize that. Our second teaching point, I think, from the text is that salvation comes through repentance and conversion. We talked about this. That's what Peter said. Repent, change. Change your behavior. Change, change your mind, change your behavior. And that comes through uh, an interchange, making up one's mind to obey what God has said in any uh, situation. Most importantly, when obeying the gospel. Um, 
Third teaching point is a repeater again. He mentions prophecy in this chapter. It's been fulfilled. So again, reiterate to your students that when God says something back here in his word and it comes true, what should that tell us? That God's right. And we can have faith in that. All right, quickly, this application. I'm going to go back to this idea in verse 16, this idea of this, this faith. When Peter says, on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. Faith is necessary to accomplish anything, is it not, brethren, in the kingdom of God? I don't, I don't care what it is. You've got to have faith. Now, our works today won't be of the same nature as what Peter and John did here. No one, I don't think anyone's thinking that's what we're going to do. But the principle is the same. Um, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You've got to have faith. And this text in Romans 4, uh, the, the, the uh, subject matter was Abraham when he was told, you're going to have these descendants. Remember how old he was? Very aged man. And there's a phrase in that text, Paul says, in hope against hope. When it didn't seem to make any sense, logic-wise, to believe what God was saying, what did Abraham do? He believed him. So importance of faith, we need to instill that into our children. That we believe this will happen because that's what God said. And that's shown, I believe, in this text. All right. Wednesday night we'll have class. We'll do chapter 4, verses 5 through verse 31. We'll stop at that point. So read that text and come prepared to engage in our class. Thank you again for coming this morning. I appreciate your efforts.